Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. Today is Monday, July 12th, 2021, starting at 5 uh, 5.43 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the 311th episode of the show. In this episode, I may be talking with astrologer Patrick Watson about the concept of stelliums in astrology and what it means to have a cluster of planets in a specific sign or a specific house in your chart. Uh, so, hey, Patrick, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me again. It's been, what, a couple months since our episode on ephemerises, ephemerides? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. June or May. Okay. So we're back. This is a big episode I've been threatening to do for years, and I've been very serious about doing since the beginning of this year. But I think it's finally time, and I'm excited to do this episode because this is a topic that lots of people are curious about, lots of people have questions about, and have asked me to cover. Um, but I think it, I needed the right combination of two astrologers with Scorpio stelliums to really pull off this episode. So I'm excited that you, you've decided to join me. <laughs> me too. Okay. All right. So let's jump right into it. So for those uh, watching, especially the YouTube version, this is going to be a deep dive into the concept of stelliums. Obviously, this isn't going to be a quick video, as you can tell by the length of the time reading in the bottom corner. Um, but what we're going to make up for in the length is by going into depth and looking at a bunch of example charts. We're going to first start by talking about the concept of stelliums, what it means, how it's defined, some of the different debates amongst astrologers about what constitutes a stellium. And then we're going to get into looking at some example charts, actually a bunch of example charts, so you can actually see how this technique works out in practice. So that is the plan. So why don't we get into it first by Defining what a stellium is. And um, stelliums to me are typically defined as a cluster of three or four or more planets that are in the same sign of the zodiac or in the same house. So, for example, let me share a little graphic that my friend Paula Bellomini made for me. So, this is an example. Let's say, for example, you've got um, Cancer rising, and let's say you've got three planets that are in the zodiacal sign of Cancer. So let's say Venus, Saturn, and Mars are in the sign of Cancer. So some astrologers define a stellium as three or more planets. So if you have any three planets in a sign, then you've got a stellium. Some astrologers, though, define it as four or more planets. So let's say instead that you had the Sun, Venus, Saturn, and Mars in the sign of Cancer. In that case, that would be a stellium or a cluster of planets in the sign of Cancer. And if that was your first house, then that would also be a first house stellium, showing an emphasis basically on that sign and that house in your birth chart. So I think that's, you know, in terms of getting started, those are our two main starting points. Just one emphasizing that a stellium is three or four or more planets in one part of the chart. And then secondarily, that it primarily what we're going to see during the course of this discussion is that it primarily just shows an emphasis on a certain part of the chart, especially on a certain sign of the zodiac and the, the qualities of that sign, as well as on a certain house and the qualities and topics associated with that house in terms of each of the 12 houses of the birth chart. So um, Let's start by the debate, the, the important all-encompassing debate about three or four planet stelliums. Um, we just learned last night that we actually had a, a disagreement about this. We didn't I didn't realize it until the day before. I've always leaned towards being more of like four or more planet definition person. Um, just because like the sun and moon or Mercury and the Sun and Venus are often within a few signs of each other, like one to two signs of each other. So it's not super uncommon to see somebody with like one or two or three of those planets in the same sign. And if you throw one other planet in there, then you've got a stellium of three planets. So that's not super, super rare, but a four-planet stellium is a bit more rare depending on which planets or bodies you're using, right? Right. I mean, my thought on it at least is that a conjunction requires at least two bodies. Right. So if a stellium is defined as four or more bodies within a sign, um, then that sort of creates this uh, uh, strange gap in uh, sort of stratas or 
levels of categorization where a, what is a three planet conjunction what is a is? three is chopped yeah. liver <laughs> right <laughs> only yeah. four or more matters i mean well, I and guess if you, you do have three that's obviously concentration so to sure. defend because i'm I, I was originally much more stringent years ago about my four planet stellium superiority but um you know as i gotten older i've gotten more uh, lax about it, and I can see three planets being a stellium because you have three planets in any sign or any house, then you've got a concentration of and an emphasis on that sign or house. So, not to mention know, at least or at most, um, six houses, you know, having the ruler of those houses being imported into that sign potentially. So, right, uh, I mean, I guess I, yeah, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how, um, you know, uh, Absolutely uh, dire, you know, this uh, disagreement is. I mean, I would probably say you can just right. categorize stelliums as, oh, you know, a three point stellium versus a four point stellium. And obviously, the more planets involved in that stellium is, is going to be less common and uh, sort of more impressive. Um, yeah, th so this isn't the house division debate where astrologers are like strapping bombs to their chest and like, <laughs> uh, you know, suicide bombing each other over this. It's like a lower level debate in astrology. However, uh, and I don't know if you want to go into this a little later or if you're comfortable going into it now, but I would think that another potential point of contention is whether or not the planets which are within a sign should be close enough to be considered in degree-based conjunctions versus um, whether it matters that they are further apart in a given sign. And yes. if those kinds of stelliums might be considered as maybe a little different than ones which are more uh, or ones which are closer by degree. Yeah, so I didn't even think about this as an issue because I've always classified stelliums as um, things that happen anytime you have like three or four or more planets in the same sign, like anywhere in the same sign or anywhere in the same house. And because I use whole sign houses, uh, as well as because I use, um, according to Hellenistic astrology, I recognize both degree based aspects as well as sign based aspects so that two planets. Anywhere in the same sign, even if one is really early in the sign and one is really late, are considered to be co-present, and their energies are thought to rub off on each other a little bit. Um, just like two people living in the same house, you have some influence from your your roommate, even if you're living on like the other side of the house from each other. Um, obviously, that's more intense if you're actually living in the same room together, but there's still some sort of relationship if you're living in the same house. So. That's how I define stelliums is by sign, but I could see I did an episode a year ago last summer with Carol Taylor on aspect patterns, and stelliums are often grouped into the different aspect patterns like the T-square or the Grand Cross or the Yod or different things like that, and stellium was one that we put off to address later but didn't get to. But I could see how if you are Treating the stellium like an aspect pattern, that aspect patterns usually do have to be a little bit closer in degree because of the orbs of like the degree based aspects involved. So I can see like a some merit to that approach. Right. I guess the way I see it is a co presence is like that's the broadest net that you could, uh, that you could throw. It's that that's kind of a catch all term. Co presence just means they could be anywhere. I feel like a stellium anywhere on the same sign. Right. Yeah. As long as they are in the same sign, it's a co-presence. I guess um, I I kind of use it interchangeably, um, but I think I would, if since we're using different words for these different things, then I guess I would consider um, if co-presences could capture could capture the idea of planets being anywhere in the sign together, then a stellium might be three or four or more planets which are more closely um, uh, lumped together by degree. Uh, within the sign, so maybe there's different uh, grades of co-presences where some maybe are further apart and have a more general uh, sort of influence, whereas stelliums, which are more tightly packed by degree, might um, just be seen as more uh, dynamic or energetic uh, co-presences. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and continue to define a stellium as just like planets co-present in a sign or in a whole sign house. Uh, different people are free to do with free to do whatever, and you know there's something to be said for like an align a close alignment or a triple conjunction or quadruple conjunction of planets all in the same degree or something like that. Because that's actually, if you think about it, like the classic 
thing that people think about or think that astrologers pay attention to if we're talking about like mundane astrology. And we actually had a good example of this last year when we had that huge pileup of planets that all aligned in the sign of Capricorn and actually got pretty close by degree, although they didn't line up by degree around March of 2020. And that was when, especially in the West and in like the US, that's when COVID hit and that's when the lockdowns happened and the entire world sort of went to hell. So it was much easier. I liked that about last year being when people are like, what's going on astrologically? And I can just say, look, all of the planets are lined up in the same sign of the zodiac right now. That's what's going on, and that was kind of pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah, and I and I think you know it's been interesting too because Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto were already kind of in range uh, in January and February, but it really wasn't until Mars entered the picture. It wasn't until Mars entered the sign, made that ingress into Capricorn, that uh, it really, <laughs> you know, it was like that was sort of when the panic kind of set in. It sort of acted as a trigger almost to, you know, an agitating uh, trigger to this. Uh, alignment that was already pretty uh kind of fearsome you know just by itself so yeah i mean that's probably i mean it's one of the it will re probably remain one of the you know absolute all-time you know <laughs> greatest examples of uh you know this kind of thing but we have a few more examples sort of like that from other periods of history uh with interesting alignments maybe we'll get to sharing those yeah um and the other thing that was interesting about that is that it continued like the most intense part of that during that initial lockdown phase and stuff continued because it was like Mars, it started really when Mars ingressed into Capricorn and joined Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto. But then Mars and Saturn got close, but they didn't complete their conjunction until they both changed signs and moved into Aquarius. And then the conjunction was at zero Aquarius. And then we had this interesting phenomenon then where as the conjunction started separating, they stayed in the same signs for like the next like month or two. Which really drew out this extended period of the Mars Saturn conjunction, which otherwise would have just lasted for what, like a month or a month and a half or something, as Mars is going through the same sign as Saturn, but it accidentally exacerbated it and drew it out or stretched it out into this much longer several month period. And I think that's another, and I think that's a really good, well, uh, real world example of the fact that it doesn't necessarily matter that. Uh, the planets were not together exactly by degree, that it was really Mars's ingress at the beginning of Capricorn that seemed to almost be the instigator or trigger of the, of the developments that kept, uh, intensifying as Mars approached by degree, uh, that Jupiter Saturn Pluto conjunction. Do you want to get too off track here? Uh, there is a couple, there's a couple of other issues we need to figure out about stelliums, which is, okay, if they don't need to be necessarily close by degree, what other, points could you potentially include for myself i tend to be someone who restricts myself to the uh traditional seven and the outers um i would include the nodes or points like the ascendant or descendant or fortune more sort of secondarily um i <laughs> i wouldn't give it i wouldn't give the nodes quite as much weight as a planet but i i generally restrict my observation of stelliums to the uh, to the planets themselves, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Yeah, and just to, to wrap up the previous discussion, I would just say, if you have four planets in the same sign, you have a stellium. And if they're closer by degree, then that stellium is going to be even more intense as a conjunction. So it's the same concept that we apply to any other sign-based versus degree-based aspect, which is that planets the aspect starts as soon as they're configured by sign, and it gets more intense and acute the closer they get by degree. I think of I think of sign-based aspects as providing kind of a general atmospheric type of relevance. Like, oh, they're co-present. We have a storm, but when the aspect actually happens by degree, that might be the lightning strike that you know uh, that hits the the person. I don't know playing with a yo-yo or something <laughs> it's like that's like the pivotal moment of the storm is you know the, the 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 damage it causes you know but the but the overall atmosphere will be kind of in the air you know uh, leading up to it definitely um so and then of course when it comes to stelliums one of the things that's interesting about them and one of the reasons they're important when it comes to timing and transits and things like that is that when let's say a planet transits through that sign in your chart 
um, it's going to always hit the same planets in order, like in relative quick succession. So it's like if you have planets at the beginning of Scorpio, four planets starting at the beginning of Scorpio, going through the end of Scorpio. Anytime a planet goes through Scorpio, it's going to hit all four of those planets. Or if you're doing annual perfections, where you you jump and you count one sign per year from the rising sign, anytime that perfection gets to that sign where you have a stellium, like let's say it's Scorpio, that's going to be a big year for you because all four of those planets are activated at the same time. So, um, I was just the last thing was just with a transit, of course, if um, it's always going to happen in the same succession. If you have, let's say, I have like Pluto at two. Maybe I should just show my chart because it's better as a as a visual instead of attempting to explain it. Um, here is my chart where I have um, Pluto at two, Scorpio, Sun at nine, Saturn at seventeen, Mercury at twenty three, and South Node at twenty seven. So anytime, let's say. Mars goes into Scorpio, which it's going to do later this year, which I'm not looking forward to. Uh, it like will conjoin Pluto first, then the Sun, then Saturn, then Mars, or then Mercury, then the South Node, in relative quick succession for Mars over the course of weeks. You know, if it was Saturn, it's over the course of two or three years. Um, but if those were closer, like if those were all within a few degrees, then it would hit them in much even quicker succession. Um, so you know that's another reason in terms of when we're talking about the intensity of something, it's almost like a like a musical instrument in terms of like hitting a string on a harp and how close after one string the next string is hit or whether there's a little bit of space between them. Yeah. Did did you like that as a musical uh, analogy? I, as yeah, my yeah, no, I always musically trained that. friend. <laughs> Was there uh, a better yeah. way way to put that? Since no, you have actual musical no, I, training, I think, no, no, I, I think that's no, I think that's this wonderful. Uh, okay. And by the way, everyone, Chris is going to be dropping his uh, album pretty soon. It's going to be my EP. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Scorpio Stella, the Scorpio Stellium EP. Scorpio, yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to give a really, really quick anecdote about a guy who has a, a stellium in the in the second house. Um, Mars. Is first in the sign, Jupiter's next in the sign, and Saturn is just after that. And I worked with this uh, gentleman in uh, his financial trading, giving him astrological advice for trading. And it was really interesting because I was, uh, we, we, uh, there was a period of time we were working fairly long hours together um, in sort of tracking astrology in real time. And I thought it was really interesting because uh, on the particular day that we were working together, the moon. Uh, went over his Mars in the second house, and that was when he had this terrible uh, loss in his uh, stock options. Mm. And then later on in the day, uh, Jupiter was contacted by the moon, and he had this great uh, experience. Uh, he managed to have uh, something. So this all happened like within one day. He had the. He finally had some. Uh, uh, some uh, stocks go up in value that he was able to make a good profit on. And then finally, uh, close to the end of the day, the moon approached his little Saturn in the second, and it kind of ended on a sad note. So it was really interesting to see just even within one day and the progress of the moon making this conjunction to this gentleman's planets in his second house that it corresponded so straightforwardly with uh, this pattern. And then we also noticed that even with the sun and its transit over those same points, he would have a good financial day when sun was on his Jupiter, but when his sun was on his Mars and Saturn, <laughs> uh, those would represent days of losses. So mm. uh, it's it, it's uh, it's it's real. <laughs> That's yeah. uh, you know seeing the pattern of uh, how planets contact when you have them in a stellium in the same house like that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, all right, so circling back to the point that you were starting to segue into, which is the other big debate, which is what points can you use or should you use to cal calculate basically whether you have a stellium? And different astrologers will do it different ways. Um, so just to like illustrate that again, going back to my chart uh, to keep talking about my stellium, which is is very important. Um, so if we use, um, let's say. All the modern planets, including Pluto and the South Node, then it's like I've got Pluto, the Sun, Saturn, Mercury, and the South Node all in Scorpio in the 10th pole sign house. So that would be a Scorpio stellium or a 10th house stellium. 
if you're using all those points. However, yeah, that doesn't fit you at all, Chris. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, however, um, if you take away the outer planets, like you get rid of the modern planets Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, then it's like I only have the Sun, Saturn, Mercury, and South Node there. So it's it goes from like a five planet stellium to a four planet stellium. However, the South Node is like not a planet; it's just a mathematical point. Um, so it's like if you took that away, then it drops me down to three planets, which is just the Sun, Saturn, and Mercury. So I say that just to belabor the point about, you know, depending on what points and what planets you're using, that can either give you a stellium or take away stellium status for you. And there's a lot of different factors that go into that that different astrologers are going to approach in different ways. So some astrologers, um, one of the other questions is like whether the ascendant degree or whether the midheaven or even the descendant or IC should be used as points that are taken into the calculation of whether you have a stellium. Like if you have, let's say, two planets in Aquarius and your ascendant is also in Aquarius, does that count as a stellium having three points there or does it not because it's only two actual planets? Um, so that's an issue. Asteroids are an issue, whether to use the nodes or whether to use uh, the lot of fortune, for example, as a point in calculating a stellium. There's a lot of variables involved. Outer planets, that's another one, right? Because um, there's an issue where some of our our newer friends who joined the astrological community over the past decade that were born in like the late 1980s or early 90s have uh, some outer planets, like Uranus and Neptune in Capricorn. So they've already got two planets that are generational in that sign. And then if you throw like one other planet in there, then all of a sudden you've got three planets. And the question of whether then you have a stellium or whether because that's a generational thing that that's not going to show up as personally. So that's kind of an issue. Where do you where do you fall on that? I think you should still uh, consider outer planets as as part of stelliums when they're more generational. Um, then we just have to assume that that's something which is going to be more true of that group, and that if you have more personal planets which are in a stellium with an outer planetary configuration, then uh, you may just come to be a particular exemplar of the potential of that conjunction on the more generational uh, level. Maybe um, you know, someone with you know a Sun-Mercury conjunction on top of Uranus and Pluto, you know, that those might be people who kind of, uh, whose words sort of carry the weight of the generation they come from or the people who are kind of listened to more or something like that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss it. And if, um, yeah, if you have outer planets in, in a house, I, I think that that, that probably has a significance. I don't know if it would be a, a daily recognizable significance, but I certainly think like if you have like, Uranus, you know, in a given house, then I would, then the, the things that seem to really bring out the meaning of that placement is when Uranus makes angular aspects to that original needle position. Um, so I, I think it's, it tends to be more relevant at certain times in one's life as opposed to, you know, uh, being like a constant <laughs> daily sort of thing, like, oh, you know, my whole life is Neptune in the eighth. Well, I'm uh, not so sure about that. but <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I also take into account the outer planets for calculations of stelliums, especially when they're mixed together with you know personal planets or inner planets. Um, yeah, especially because to whatever extent it's just showing an emphasis on a certain sign or a certain house, like those are going to have a major um, impact on that sign or house if they're present there, especially if they're together with other personal bodies, like the moon or the sun or Mercury or even Venus or Mars. Um, so that's one thing. Ascendant midheaven, I'm a little mixed on. Um, I could see it going either way. I do think we'll have some examples of some people that clearly have first house stelliums and having them in the ascendant or the midheaven just emphasizes that even further. Um, normally, I, I kind of view it as more of a planetary thing. So it's something that we're looking for planets to be placed in a sign to emphasize it. So I'm primarily weighting those in terms of you know determining whether a person has a stellium. But ultimately, what is or isn't a stellium is so subjective because it, the actual interpretive principle is just there's an emphasis on that sign or there's an emphasis on that house, and that's it. So 
really any astrologer can adapt that to their own astrology in terms of what they think is important in order to determine what is a stellium to them, and that's perfectly sufficient and fine. Totally. All right, so we solved that debate. That de- debate is done. Um, what, what do we got to move on to next? Oh, is there well, any other now we have the real debate is what's the plural form? Oh, that's the, that is the most important debate. Well, this got settled recently because you did you correct me? I don't know if you corrected me in private, but you were you said uh, stel, stelia. So, the, so stellium obviously is the primary word for the singular when a person has the singular a stellium in Scorpio or in the tenth house or what have you. But then there's sometimes the question of no, no astrologers like know what to say when there's like when you're talking about. The plural of multiple stelliums, in which case, what is the plural? And what did you say originally it was? Well, I mean, I think some people say say said stellia, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because the in in according to Latin, you know, from uh, <laughs> my my uh, my D plus grade in advanced Latin, uh, it told, uh, I remember either the the form the plural form should be stelle, but I mean. You know, I think uh, we don't need to use the grammatical rules from a different language to be able to, you know, use the English uh, pluralization <laughs> conventions, like adding an s to the end of the word. I don't think there's necessarily anything really wrong with that. And uh, I think you said, I think someone on Twitter actually who knew what they were talking about kind of said the same thing. Yeah, that was like an actual English professor. So I want to give a shout out to them where they said. They were responding some to some tweet of mine where I said I tend to prefer to say stelli- stelliums instead, even if that's not grammatically correct. And they said this is at Kutchlin uh, on Twitter. They said if you're interested in the opinion of an English professor, it is always correct in English to use the s suffix to make something plural. So this isn't even a prescriptive versus descriptive grammar thing. It's a thing where people insist on loan words adhering to the original grammar. So well, that's it. I'm saying sheeps. I'm saying deers. I'm. <laughs> it's always correct. Uh, yeah. Well, I I don't know. I'm going to take that anonymous person's. Uh, yeah. Stellium is fine. <laughs> statement to heart, and I. If you want to be snooty, though, stelle is the stelle way. or stelia. Yeah. I, I maybe okay. So I'm going to say stelliums because I think I'm just doing that partially because I think that's what people are going to search for on Google in right. searching for this episode. So. Yeah, not many Romans out there using Google. Right. <laughs> I got to go with the crowd. All right. So we've we've got is that all the debates or are there any more stellium related debates that we have to address? I think we're bloodied up enough, Chris. All right. That was tough, but we had to do it. There's no other <laughs> 10 minute like podcast episode that's going to have dealt with this as efficiently as we have. So let's move on to one of the things we were going to mention in passing is like you know, this goes back pretty far. Vadius Valens, for example, in the second century, at the end of book one of the anthology, he actually has delineations where he goes through and he delineates two and three planet combinations when they're in the same sign. Um, so there are some traditional astrologers that do interpret planets when they're in the same sign as mixing together, and they sometimes use a, a painting analogy of paint. When you mix paint together, how it produces different colors just through the presence of one color with another and how different colors interact. And Valens actually has this extended discussion at one point, I think in like book five or six of the anthology, where he says that's why the malefics tend to stand out so much because it's like a really dark paint and adding it to a white or a translucent paint, like it, where it kind of tends to overwhelm some of the other colors or something like that. Um, so I liked that that painting analogy when we're talking about this idea of co-presence or co-mixture of planets in the same sign, and I think that's one good way to approach interpreting stelliums when you have three or four or more planets in the same sign is understanding that they're all mixing together, and by their presence in the same sign, by virtue of that, they are influencing and changing the other in subtle and sometimes very important ways. And it should be noted too for those uh, valence delineations that those he's he's only considering them as co-presences. So no matter where they are in the sign, his interpretation will apply. But he's not taking into account zodiacal sign. He's not taking into account the house. Um, it's it's just 
for a general co-presence uh, of, of uh, those two or three planets uh, in a sign, but still quite interesting. Um, you can sometimes extract some interesting insights from some of his delineations. Yeah, so here's one he gives. He says, Jupiter, Mars, and Venus, cause when they're in the same sign, he's saying implicitly, cause men to have many friends, to be easy to associate with, to be thought worthy of association with and help from the great, to be successful and to progress with the help of women. These stars make some men high priests, prize winners, athletes, or supervisors of temples or of the masses. They cater to their own pleasures and at times live unsteadily, subject to ups and downs. Um, and then he keeps going, he gives kind of like negative stuff. Um, These men are blameworthy and indiscriminate about sexual matters, experiencing public exposure and betrayal, agree with the sexual insulin. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. It comes to mind. I think uh, you know he, Valens probably would have said Bill Clinton has uh, a Mars, Venus, Jupiter, okay. uh, stellium in the first, um, which is <laughs> kind of funny how that sort of uh, matches up uh, pretty well of him. Yeah, let um, me. Let he me didn't find... know about Neptune, but did not know about Neptune when it came to what was his slick Willie? Is that he, yeah, something like that? But it's yeah, I just reading that uh interpretation just made me realize that he has that uh he has that stellium in his first house mars jupiter and venus and he seems to typify some of the things that um Vaillant has described in that uh paragraph yeah so, again, and then he didn't take into account sign or house but the general interpretation general delineation works pretty well yeah, and and that's the thing is that in a full interpretation, we would actually take into account some of the various things in order to break down what planets in the stellium are more important, or what role certain planets are playing, or what role other planets are playing. Um, his is actually interesting because using the modern planets, he actually has two stelliums. So this is an example of you know somebody that has a, a he has the ascendant Mars, Neptune, Venus, and Jupiter in Libra. Uh, so all in the same sign, so a Libra stellium, and then also in the in the first whole sign house. I guess even using quadrant houses, this would be in the first house because they're all below the degree of the ascendant. And then he's got um, Saturn, Mercury, Pluto, and the Sun up there in Leo in the eleventh house. So heavy first house and eleventh house emphasis, and heavy Libra and Leo emphasis, which is a pretty good uh, descriptor. Pretty appropriate for. Uh Kind of the, the sort of charmer, you know, uh, that yeah. he's often kind of associated with being. Um, yeah, with with that Libra rising and Venus in Libra in the first house conjunct Neptune with um, Jupiter. That was the thing that I've always read, especially about him in his early political career and in his first run for president. Because I was I was too young at the time, but they always talked about just how engaging and kind of like charming he was. And a lot of those keywords that I hear really remind me of that that Venus ruled uh, Libra stellium in the first house. Totally. Yeah. All right. So um, so that's our first sort of quick, quick glimpse into um, a example chart, which we're going to get into more before we get into other example charts. So um, is any have there been any other astrologers other than Valens who've written about this kind of combinations prior to the 20th century? Yeah, so you were you were saying Abu Mashar may have in the Great Introduction, and I pulled it up, and I wasn't sure. It looked like there was a section where it was delineating some planets, but I don't know if it delineated all possible combinations. Mm -hmm. Which you said there might be a text out there somewhere that does. Yeah, it was based on a comment by Rob Hand. Robert Hand made a statement in the notes of one of the preliminary Project Hindsight translations of Valens, where he mentions that. There's a text that Abu Mashar wrote where he delineates the combination of all seven planets in the sign of the time, the traditional seven, but we haven't been able to figure out which book that is. So uh, if anyone out there knows, uh, feel free to let us know. Yeah, so if anyone finds that, let us know in the comments. I know the Yavanajataka and some of the Indian texts definitely go to great lengths to provide delineations for different combinations, and I think there may be one in there that does produce delineations for a lot of different combinations like that and conjunctions in the same sign. Um, yeah, so we don't have to get into that very much. There is a weird derivation. When you look up dictionaries, um, I think somebody asked the question of 
because I put out a call for questions and I got swamped with way too many. So sorry to everybody, but I'm not going to get through all of them in this episode. But on Twitter, SJ Anderson did ask, any ideas on the history of the usage of the term stellium and where it originates, who it originates with in the tradition? And there's actually an interesting thing. I haven't done a lot of work on this, but in some dictionaries, it says that the word stellium is connected to some non-astrological dictionaries, so written by non-astrologers, but you know, professional word researchers, um, connect it to the word satellitium, um, and they say that it's a grouping of several planets and a sign or what have you. And I thought that was really interesting because if that's true, then this the term satellitium might be connected to the Hellenistic concept of spear bearing, which is known as Dorophoria in Hellenistic astrology, um, which almost kind of makes sense because the basic version of spear bearing is just when the luminaries are surrounded by planets that act as bodyguards for the luminaries. Um, so literally, you can think about the modern concept of like the president of the United States or some high-ranking politician who's just surrounded by bodyguards when they move through a crowd who are protecting them by staying in close proximity to that person. And so we have this older concept of like a satellite and the modern term of a satellite, which for example, like the moon is a satellite of the earth and it's like a body that orbits in pretty close proximity to the earth. So I haven't researched this enough. Like I sh nobody should take this as definitive, but if that derivation is correct, then it may have the, the modern concept of stellium, or at least the modern term stellium, may have been derived in that indirect way from the concept of spear bearing. Um, but even if that's not correct, it probably just developed conceptually or practically as the idea of you know, what happens when there's more than two planets that are in a conjunction or in the same sign, what happens when there's three or four or more. That I think that's possible. And um there would probably have to have been some change somewhere because I know that at least in Antiochus of Athens he defines uh, spear bearers for the in a day chart any planets which are within a trine of the sun in a day chart whereas in a nocturnal chart it's where any planets which are falling within a sextile of the moon. Um, yeah, he gives three different definitions of spear oh, okay. bearing. I think I think that's the second or third one, um, but the first one is. Um, planets that are rising before the sun and that like clear the way for the sun in the same um, sign. It's not really clear because it doesn't give ranges, but it just says if they're rising before the sun and it's like implied that they're close enough to it that they've risen relatively recently. So they're mm. probably within, if okay, not the well, same then sign, they're within a sign or two. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Or the moon, it says if they set after the moon, then they're. Acting as spear bearers for the moon in the first definition of spear bearing, but then it later elaborates on that with those other ones that have to do with aspects and says that planets can cast aspects into the sign to protect the sun or moon without being present there themselves bodily. Yeah, so Demetra has a whole breakdown of spear bearing, I think, in her first book, Ancient Astrology, Volume One. All right, why don't we? I think we've done a pretty good job of breaking down some of the basics. Is it time to start like getting into some chart examples so we can get in the details? Yeah, I think so. I think people would probably like to see uh, how does it actually work in practice. You know, what does it mean for a house to be emphasized in someone's life with a stone? Yeah. So, um, it's like we could start with first house, but I don't think I want to start with first house ones. I think I want to start with the other ones because I want to right away demonstrate that concept, and I want to jump through some different house examples of. What it actually looks like if somebody has a stellium in a house, and how what will happen is that house will tend to stand out, and the topics associated with that house will tend to stand out in the native's life as being distinctive in some way, more so compared to the average, or more so compared to like some other average person's life who doesn't have you know four or more planets in that sign. So let's um, let's take a look at some examples. Um, of that, where I did a search through my uh, my database using Solar Fire and asked it to return four planet stelliums for me. So one of the first ones I wanted to highlight that I love is um, this is actually an example that Lisa 
pointed out to me first, I believe. So this is the children's book author Judy Bloom, who has won like a bunch of the highest awards for children's books, and she's written like a ton of children's books, which I think she actually got started writing at first when her children were really young. So she was born with Libra rising, and she has four planets in the sign of Aquarius, which are in the fifth whole sign house, which is the house, of course, traditionally associated with children for the past 2,000 years. So that's a pretty straightforward example. Like where, where if somebody walked into your, let's say, astrology business, let's say you have an astrology business that's on the street, and this person just walks in and sits down and they they slam their chart down on the table and they say, Tell me about my life. And the first thing that you see is, wow, you have four planets in the sign of Aquarius in the fifth house of children. And the most like simple basic statement you could make about that person's life is, for some reason, it seems like a, a, a decent amount of focus in your life will be on the topic of children. And you could say something as simple as that, and it would actually turn out to be stunningly true for this person because indeed she uh, has you know, devoted and spent a great deal of time in her life perhaps more time in her life than other people by average focusing on the topic of children. So pretty good. What do you think? Straightforward? Yeah, very pretty pretty straightforward. The ruler of the first in the fifth. Uh, you even get Mercury and Jupiter in there, which have those connotations with uh, writing, publishing. Yeah. Um, so that so you're getting into other yeah. pieces, and that's an important right. piece. And maybe we should break that down because I think that was one of the other questions that it, that did come in through Twitter that I picked up on, which is, um, how do you deal with and how do you weight some of the other planets when they come into play when you're talking about the specific planets that are involved in the stellium? Because there's some part of this which is just, um, you know. If you have four planets in any house, that house is going to be more important. Um, end of sentence, and like you can kind of stop there. And that's one of the things that's nice about stelliums is like you can make a strikingly accurate statement and just stop at that point, and that statement will sort of hold up on its own without having to go into further details about well, how does that topic go, and do things go well in that person's life, or do they go uh, in a more challenging way, or other details like that. Which really gets into what is the composition of the stellium of like what planets are involved. Um, but one weighting factor that really weights things that we're going to see come up over and over again is is one of the planets the ruler of the ascendant. So in her case, she has Libra rising. So the planet that rules the ascendant, which is a very important planet in the chart, is going to be Venus. And Venus is actually one of the planets that's in that stellium in the fifth whole sign house in Aquarius. So that's a little tricky because that then weights things differently, where it puts even more emphasis on the fifth house if one of the planets is also the ruler of the ascendant. And I would say gives even more weight to the stellium. So that stellium is going to be even heavier or going to have an even larger impact or influence on the life than it might if none of those planets, for example, was the ruler of the ascendant. Well, it would be more personal to her because she is represented by Venus in that chart. Um, so if she didn't have Venus in the fifth house, but she still had the Sun, Mercury, and Jupiter, then we might think, think that those uh, planets in, in the fifth house would be more relevant to her experiences with children or youths, or um, if she was a mother and dealing with her own children. Uh, but the fact that her ascendant ruler is actually in there as well shows that is actually she's sort of partaking in these fifth house themes. Uh, and topics of of creative works and uh, play, recreation, and uh, youth and children, etc. So, yeah, I think it's yeah, good. yeah. So it's like that's a important thing because the ruler of the ascendant and the house placement of it tends to show a topic that the native's life tends to be directed towards, or where there tends to be more focus on that topic in the native's life than. Normal compared to just like the average or compared to other people. So it gets a little tricky then because when there's overlap, because the stellium kind of does the same thing, because the stellium is almost like, you know, those pictures of like a black hole where in space it's just like you put a bunch of weight and then it just like 
drags down or weighs down the space in that area. Stelliums are kind of like the same thing where they just um, put so much weight and so much uh, gravity in that area that it almost like becomes a distortion field that like drags a, your attention to it in some way. So the stellium in some way is almost overlapping a little bit what the ruler of the ascendant does um, in, indirectly. So it's a little bit tricky then because um, you know if the ruler of the ascendant is in the stellium, then it's going to put more weight on that stellium, but also vice versa. The stellium will put more weight on the ruler of the ascendant placement by sign and house, and will make that sign and house stand out even more than it would have if it was just the ruler of the ascendant there. Correct. Yeah, so that's a factor. Other factors in terms of interpreting stelliums and how well the topic goes is um, is the stellium composed of like benefic planets or malefic planets? And also you need to take into account factors like sect and whether the most positive planet in the chart is in the stellium according to the concept of sect, which is going to be Jupiter in a day chart or Venus in a night chart, or conversely, is the most challenging or negative planet according to sect in the stellium, which is going to be Mars in a day chart or Saturn in a night chart. That's going to create a little bit more tension or a little bit more difficulties surrounding um, that area in the person's life. So with Judy Bloom, it's a little bit mixed, but it's like for the most part, she's got relatively nice planets placed there, which are Mercury, Jupiter, the Sun, and Venus. Um, it gets a little bit complicated because it's all like ruled by Saturn in a night chart in the seventh, but that actually ends up relating more to some like relationship struggles that she had that she was very like open about, um, having Mars and Saturn in the seventh whole sign house. So what planets are composing the stellium is the ruler of the ascendant and the stellium. These are different factors that will weigh things differently. Another weighing factor that we could take into account is you know, the big three and just the concept of the big three of your sun and moon being so important, and especially the sun in a day chart or the moon in a night chart. If your stellium is partially composed of one of those, that's also going to add additional weight, and it's going to tie it in more with your personality and certain types of personality characteristics than it might otherwise. Absolutely. And then you can also throw in rulerships in there as well, <laughs> that each of those planets also serves as the ruler of a house or houses, and in sort of further, not doesn't just import its natural significations, but also uh, the uh, topics of the houses that it rules. So it can get pretty complicated, but when you write it all out, or you know, uh, it's uh, you know, it's giving you all of that information about that stellium. Yeah, what it so really and, means, and the fact that each of those planets rules one or two houses, and it's like importing significations. That's the other reason why it's kind of like this, like black hole. Maybe isn't the best like um, analogy, and I'm struggling to come up with a better one. But just the the idea of that being like this displacement field that um, just draws so much energy into it and has so much energy because it has so much weight in it due to the preponderance, basically, of planets in the chart being in one sector of the chart rather than being spread out evenly so that they're they're more um, not balanced because balanced isn't the right term but certainly there is a concentration or an intensification of the energy of just one sign or one house which is somewhat unusual compared to you know most people just have like one or uh, two or zero planets in a specific sign rather than having all of them in the same sign. Right. And I guess that's maybe we should mention the extreme version of the stellium because we did actually have some of those. Like, for example, in what was it, like February of 1962, there was a big pileup of planets in Aquarius, and there were some like Aquarius stellium people, right? Yeah. Who were our two? Like, we don't have a lot to say about them, but one of them was, um, and this one was found by Claire Moon. I wanted to give her a shout out for finding this one. So, like Garth Brooks, for example, the country singer has a stellium in Aquarius where it's like Saturn, Mars, Mercury, South Node, Sun, Jupiter, Venus, and 
the midheaven degree all in Aquarius. So just a ton of planets in that same sign and in that same house. And the only ones that he doesn't have in there are like the moon, which is in Pisces. So it just actually barely got out of Aquarius a couple days earlier. And then the North Node's in Leo and Uranus is in Leo, Pluto is in Virgo, and Neptune is in Scorpio. So you actually found one other big celebrity who was a uh, that same Aquarius stellium, right? Um would that be Eddie Izzard? I mean I can't, yeah. I can't claim I discovered. I mean I know I know of him as well. Right, you example, personally yeah. discovered yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, Eddie Izzard has that same um that same stellium. Now we're not exactly sure whether or not to trust the uh birth time. Um uh apparently um on his website uh they said that uh Pluto was rising uh the time they were born, but he, they could have been joking too. <laughs> yeah. Um so that so, could be so yeah, so it could be either Virgo rising or it could even be like late Leo rising if they were using quadrant houses like Placidus, that would also indicate right. they would interpret that as Pluto rising as well. Yeah. The only thing that I would be able to sort of connect to sixth house themes about uh, Eddie Izzard is the fact that um, for, I guess, for charity, uh, they decided to, um, he, they did like um, multiple marathons over, like consecutively, uh, did like these sort of, these uh, huge uh, long distance runs uh, to, to, to raise money. And, uh, Eddie Gizzard had never done any, <laughs> like, uh, professional running, uh, before, but, um, uh, it was, it was like some ridiculous length that, uh, he, he ran over a small period of time and, um, sort of connects to those sort of six house themes of like effort seeing you know, it makes me think of like Mars Saturn, like it's someone who has like a lot of energy and a lot of, uh, you know, grit uh, to kind of uh, be able to work hard and and uh, stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it, it could be, but I still, I don't know. Thinking about some of their early specials, like it would be really interesting if they did have like lately arising, and that Uranus would be close to the ascendant in the first, and then the ruler of the ascendant would that be that Jupiter in Aquarius, which would then be in the seventh house, applying to conjunction with Jupiter. That's um, true. Yeah. So I'm not I sure. Uh, hopefully, this is one of those, you know, we have probably like hundreds of these in our mind, which are just like, I hope before I die at some point, I find out Eddie Izzard's birth time or many other celebrities who that will probably go to the grave not knowing uh, what the correct birth time is. But every once in a while, you find out, you know, uh, celebrity birth time. And it's always nice to have that confirmed one way or another. Yeah. So, um, uh, that actually brings up a rectification course that you and I are working on, where we're thinking about doing a rectification course and teaching people some of the factors that you would take into account if you were trying to figure out your ascendant or rising sign and you're trying to narrow it down. For example, in that one, that was just a very quick thing, and obviously we don't know a lot about his life aside from you know some a few public things. But um, when you do have somebody that will tell you about your life and give you all the information you need, or if you're trying to figure out your own birth chart and narrow down the correct rising sign or the correct ascendant. Um, so yeah, if people would be interested in a class on that, let us know because we're we're thinking very we're considering very strongly about developing one. Very excited about that. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to some other house examples. Um, what do we do? Which one did we just do? We just did Eddie Izzard. Um, right, we did other. Oh yeah, I did Judy Bloom. You actually had another one that was a nice um, one to put together with the Eddie with the um, Judy Bloom one, which was another fifth house example, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's the chart. So this is the chart for uh, Thomas Beatty. Yeah, so this is the chart of Thomas Beatty, and so you can see just like Judy Bloom. Uh, he was born with Libra rising, with the ruler of the ascendant, Venus, placed in the fifth whole sign house, much like Judy Bloom, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter. And Thomas Beatty is um, a trans man who 
is an advocate for uh, trans uh, fertility uh, and uh, uh, reproductive uh, justice and uh, reproductive matters. And uh, the, he received a lot of media attention uh, back in 2008 through 2010 for being uh, sort of the quote-unquote uh, first uh, trans, uh, first uh, pregnant man. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how the ruler of the ascendant connects uh, this person to the topic of fertility, sexuality, reproduction, um, children. And uh, so uh, he had three children. And uh, it's interesting as well because similar to Judy Bloom, um, the ruler of the fifth house is ruled by this nighttime Saturn. And so a little later on, you know, unfortunately things didn't go so well with uh, the partner and there was some, um, uh, I guess, uh, controversies or, or uh, problems with the partner in dealing with the, the children and uh, so the custody battles and things like that. So I think... Um, I think that's a really interesting way we can see the the commonality between Judy Bloom and Thomas Beattie in that they both had lives which uh, which have this special connection to these fifth house topics of creativity, not just uh, creative arts like for Judy Bloom, but um, even relating to this uh, notion of uh, reproduction as creativity or creation. Um, yeah, totally. So, and it's a four planet stellium, so it's four. You know, definite planets, and then also one of them is the ruler of the ascendant, which is that Venus ruling the Libra rising. So it's a great example, and that's another example of how you know we're seeing like archetypes with the astrology, a fifth house placement. But then obviously, there's a lot of different ways that can work out, and then there's a lot of different specifics based on the planets involved and the rest of the configurations in the person's chart, as well as just their life context of like what is the context that this person is bringing to the table, which then is infused in and helps give life to this chart, and then they manifest some version of that that fits their life in an archetypal sense. Yeah, so good good example. Um, okay, so those are a couple of fifth house examples. I don't think we have any other fifth house examples, do we? Are we missing any? I mean, um, I, I went through bunches, but I tried to find ones that people might be able to more sort of easily Oh, understand. Actually, a lot of them required a lot of explanation. <laughs> no, yeah, I just I actually have one. I forgot that I have one more. This is more of a depressing example, but it's more personal to me, and it allows me to connect a, a sinistry thing that's actually kind of nice. Um, so one of my my fifth house examples that I've used in the past is actually uh, my dad's chart. Who I didn't slip this chart in my book. I think I alluded to it. This is the actual chart, and. He had um, cancer rising and then a almost quasi cancer stellium with the moon, Uranus, Jupiter, ascendant, and south node in cancer. But more importantly and more relevantly, a Scorpio stellium with Mercury, Saturn, uh, the Sun, and Venus in Scorpio in the fifth whole sign house in a night chart. Uh, the lot of fortunes also there in Scorpio in the fifth house. So um, during in the like early to mid 1980s, um, he and my mom got together, and he was the one that was actually interested in having children, um, or more interested in having children than my mom was. And um, unfortunately, it was part of it is they started having children during his Saturn return when Saturn went through Scorpio and went through his fifth house and activated that fifth house stellium. But the sun is there in the fifth house, so this is actually a night chart. So Saturn is. Contrary to the sect, and it's the most difficult planet in the chart. So, unfortunately, the first part of that was that um, a year before me, I had an older brother who was born, but he actually died as an infant within his first year of life of um, sudden infant death syndrome. So, they like left the baby with like a babysitter and like went out and came back, and the baby had died like really tragically. And at some point during that, like grieving process at some point, I then was like conceived and came along later when Saturn was at 15 degrees of Scorpio. And then what's funny about that, of course, with him having that 
Scorpio stellium, which doesn't just include Saturn, but also includes Venus, which is uh, consequently the most positive planet in the chart. So there's a a weird sort of um, dual thing that comes into play where the most positive and most negative planet is in the chart. So you kind of get both. So one of the things that's that's funny then, of course, is if he has a fifth house um, fifth house stellium in Scorpio, you know who comes along. Then at his Saturn return, which is me, who has a also a Scorpio stellium, which happens to fall in his fifth house. So that's kind of an interesting sinistry thing where sometimes you have to think about when somebody has a stellium, that that stellium is going to fall in somebody in a house in somebody's chart and is going to activate that in different ways. So sometimes that could be like the seventh house, and they could be like an important relationship partner for you if they have like a stellium that falls in your seventh house, or if your your stellium falls in their seventh house, it could be in your, let's say, ninth house or third house or something, and they could be an important teacher for you, your eleventh house, and they could be an important friend, or maybe even like let's say twelfth house or sixth house, they could be an important like enemy of your like your greatest enemy or something like that. Um, there's lots of different ways that stelliums also come into play through sinistry, which is another interesting thing to think about. That was the saddest and sweetest story, uh, Chris. Thank you. Um, that is that is me. That is what I'm what I'm good at. And you know, it's interesting too. Um, you know, I've I've uh, something I've noticed when people are having children that. Sometimes the relevant fifth house transit seems to be happening around the time of birth. And there have been some cases where there have been any kind of fifth house transit. And I was kind of wondering, well, what is that about? But then if I scroll back nine months prior to the birth, then that's when you see like the big fifth house thing. So it's interesting to see how sometimes the fifth house activation or transit uh, for someone when they're becoming a parent doesn't always correspond with the birth, but sometimes with the conception or something just after birth. So um uh yeah really interesting example chris yeah when we talked about that actually at one point uh i think it was in episode 15 you and i talked about the ethics of using electional astrology at right. the time of birth but that wasn't the main reason i'm bringing that up the main reason i'm bringing it up because you were having like a saturn return when you had your in last my, child <laughs> in the in fifth house fifth, right yes yeah yeah, yeah. luckily it's kind. gone it's gone better than uh your father's right um but uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, and that's, I mean, that's astrology as you said, what did you say? You said it's like the sweetest and the most depressing. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's astrology and that's something you have to get used to, but it's also yeah. the, the part that's really amazing to me that's underlying everything, which is the underlying sense of like meaning and purpose and destiny and fate that interweaves throughout people's lives. And sometimes you know, has really tragic things, but also sometimes has really beautiful things in the same sentence. And um, that's something I, I still ultimately like appreciate about the astrology and I see as a as a value and as something that's beautiful rather than just always something that's, you know, overwhelming or depressing or what have you. Right. Yeah. Bittersweet. And yeah, uh, yeah it's yeah, definitely for, it. for sure. Amazing. All right. So those are my fifth house examples. Let's move on to some other houses. Um, how about seventh house? Do we have, I have one depressing seventh house example. Let me ha- see if I have some positive ones. What do you got for seventh house again? <laughs> my one, well, it's not, I mean, it's a little tiny bit depressing, but um, I have uh, Zack Snyder, uh, who okay. we have an A rated time for, and he was born with. Uh, so at a Sun, Mercury, Mars, Saturn stellium in the Pisces seventh. Okay. And so, so, so Virgo rising Pisces stellium. Yeah. So the ruler at the first is in the seventh. So we know that uh, this is going to, you know, be a more uh, personal sort of experience for him. And so uh, essentially, Zack Snyder is obviously he's very private about his personal life, but just from the basic facts, we can tell that he has had a complicated history with relationships. Um, he has eight children um, with three different wives or three different women. And uh, uh, so that in itself is sort of interesting. I think he met his current wife at his Saturn return, 
but he was married at the time that he um, first met her. And I think one of the other really interesting things about Zack Snyder's seventh house is the fact that Mercury in this show doesn't just rule the first house himself, but it also rules the tenth house of bosses and authorities. And he also has the ruler of the seventh house in the tenth. And so usually when you see like a tenth house, seventh house interaction, it can indicate that one's partnerships have a connection to one's professional activities. So it's really interesting because his, uh, the woman he eventually would be married for the longest amount of time he was currently married to, uh, he first met her um, at his Saturn return and she hired him to work on a commercial. And then they met up a few years later when he was divorced and um, she hired him again. <laughs> so, and now they work together on producing his movies. They, they founded a production company. So they have this professional relationship that is also a personal and romantic one, marriage. Uh, so, you know, um, maybe the fact that it's ruled by Benefic, <laughs> you know, is helping out, uh, his seventh house. But we also know that, um, you know, the presence of these other planets, you know, shows that he's, he's endured several separations and obviously with high consequences, high stakes, you know, with that many, children being involved in these uh, partnerships. And uh, it's also worth mentioning that um, he's technically a night chart because the sun has gone below the horizon. And one of the uh, really tragic things that's happened to uh, Zack Snyder is that one of his children uh, died from suicide, um, which caused him to have to leave the production of a film. And he has the ruler of the fifth in uh, in the seventh, uh, you know, in proximity to Mars. And so we just know that there's some you know, tragedy uh, potentially associated with um, his Saturn and his placement in the houses that it rules. And um, so, yeah, a bit heavy. Um, uh, and we don't have all the details because obviously, you know, it's his personal life. But uh, but we can tell that, I mean, you know, not if we didn't know anything about this person, you know, we would still be able to make some of these statements about his life just based on the placement of this stellium and its rulers. Yeah, that's really good and really interesting. Um, this is good because there's a crossover. So he was married three times and he has a stellium in the seventh house of relationships and marriage. Um, I actually have another uh, one of my seventh house examples is like that and was also married three times. And that is the um, birth chart of Carl Sagan. So Carl Sagan was born with uh, Taurus rising. And he had Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and the Sun all in Scorpio in the seventh whole sign house. So they're actually below the horizon. So it's in the sixth quadrant house. But that's why I don't use quadrant houses because it's clearly in his seventh house. And he also was married three times. He had three major relationships during the course of his life. And interestingly, like your example, um, his last relationship, he was married to a woman who ended up, they ended up um, partnering up together and doing a lot of work together. Um, and I think part of like the Cosmos series, and they ended up co uh, collaborating on that. And they also ended up collaborating on um, that last book that he did, which is the book uh, Contact. And then I think she helped after he died to see some of his projects through to completion afterwards, including eventually um, making a movie out of contact that ended up starring Jodie Foster. So this is somebody who, <laughs> huh? Oh, sorry. I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great movie. It's one of my favorite movies as well. I like rewatch it every once in a while. Um, early M Matthew McConaughey movie too, actually. Yes. Seeing... Yeah. Yeah. True. He's still shirtless. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thankfully. But so, <laughs> You know, this is another one where he marriage was obviously important, or he's married three different times. So at least relationship and marriage uh, was an important part of this person's life. And then towards the end, it actually became tied up not just with his love life, but even with his career and with the actions and like contributions that he ended up making to the world in general. And it's interesting with him again. It's like ruler of the ascendant as well, which is kind of overlap with the one you just used, where he's Taurus rising and has Venus there. So. There's something about the focus or the overall direction of the life that gets caught in the stellium at the same time. All right, so those are seventh house examples. My only other seventh house example I use sometime 
which is a little bit more depressing, but it's like the uh, classic, the Kurt Cobain example, which actually looks very similar to your Zack Snyder chart. I think we discovered that they were actually born a year apart, but they have some overlap with some of their placements. So Kurt Cobain was Virgo rising with Mercury in Pisces in the seventh whole sign house, along with the Sun and Venus and Saturn. And, um, you know, the main thing that's sort of relevant and interesting and remarkable about this is just that he did have this major relationship towards the end of his life. I mean, there were relevant relationship things. Like, I think, um, Smells Like Teen Spirit, for example, was, I think it was, um, Named after some like comment that one of his ex girlfriends made at one point. So there's little bits from like earlier in his life where relationships were important. But, um, you know, he has Venus there in a night chart, the most positive planet, but also Saturn there in a night chart as the most negative planet. And he both had, um, some very positive things as, as a result of relationships, but also some very challenging things. And toward in the last few years of his life, um, of course, he famously died during his Saturn return. He died young, um, but he got together with Courtney Love, who, on the one hand, was like the love of his life, but then on the other hand, and in some respects, towards the end of his life, like tried to save him when he um, had a suicide attempt in Italy. She was the one that like called the police, and even though it's commonly there's like a lot of conspiracy theories that like Courtney supposedly killed Kurt. There's a lot of like contrary things where it seems like she actually tried some things to get to try to save him, including doing an intervention with his friends. But then on the other hand, there were some bad things like the fact that both of them bonded over their mutual heroin usage and that that ended up contributing in some ways to his eventual spiral um, that eventually like led to his death after he broke out of a rehab facility that all of his friends and family had urged him to go to just a few weeks earlier after a suicide attempt. So it's really complicated, but um, you know, knowing that Kurt Cobain had like a Pisces stellium and that was all in his seventh house of relationships and marriage, and then the famous, even still lasting impact, the fact that they're still making like movies and like conspiracy theories about whether his wife was involved in his death. Is just interesting and ironic, even just at that, you know. Totally. So that is, Kurt, and he, of course, famously um, signed his in his suicide note. He referred to himself in passing as like a sad little Pisces, as he was like apologizing to his his daughter and his wife for like leaving them, and that's always sort of also stuck with me, just in terms of that. In some ways, he identified with some of the, you know, character traits that people associate with Pisces, but partially because it has that heavy Saturn placement there in a night chart in Pisces, it was kind of dragging down the stellium to some extent, or at least some of the more challenging aspects of it were coming to the forefront. Yeah. All right. So that's my that's my depressing seventh house example. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's let's lighten lighten this up a little bit. We're gonna keep alternating between like, you know, um, bombers actually, and uppers. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to pull out some good ones. So um, help me find some good ones really quickly to <laughs> turn turn this around. I mean, for just like sign based ones, I don't know that the birth time for this one is good. But somebody, Claire Moon, pointed out to me that Beyonce has a Libra stellium, like a really powerful Libra stellium. And I think that's really interesting of Mercury, Saturn, Jupiter, Venus, and Pluto. And I think that's just a great example of somebody that's like using uh, a Venus-based stellium in a very powerful and very effective way to be one of the, you know, most notable and highest earning like creative artists in the world as a singer, but also um, in the way that she's not just a singer, but really has full artistic control over and has gone in very artistic directions with her career. No, absolutely. And I think what's so interesting too about um, uh, Beyonce and uh, quite a few of the pop artists from, from that sort of generation is that they were all born in the same year that MTV first aired, 1981. Mm. So you get like, uh, you know, uh, Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, uh, you know, and a lot of these other, um, sort of pop stars that came of age or came to prominence in that period in the late nineties, early two thousands 
along with Beyonce as part of Destiny's Child, um, you know, who were all born with this uh, Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Libra and varying degrees of interaction with that. And uh, they seem to be like, you know, kind of the exemplars. But obviously, Beyonce has risen above, you know, all of them. She's still performing, still active, never really had a hiatus, and, you know, seems to have, she's really the, <laughs> the top i feel like of um you know what that generation is able to produce um you know so yeah she's got this yeah, incredible um stellium and it brings up two points one of them is just is the planet that owns the sign there as in this instance where it's like venus which is the ruler of the stellium is actually in that sign in its own domicile and therefore um able to provide Kind of a pure expression of that sign or of the archetypal energy of of both that sign and that planet. Um, but then two, what are what's the condition of the other planets? And we find like Jupiter there, we find Saturn there, which is in the sign of its exaltation, even Mercury there, which um I don't focus on triplicity dignity very much, but it's kind of interesting Mercury having some possibly having dignity by triplicity. So that situation of Venus, the ruler of the stellium. And maybe that should be stated that the ruler of the stellium is really important. And if it's there in its own sign, um, in some instances, that's going to be um, a more well situated stellium versus, in most cases, like the ruler of the sign is probably not going to be there, but that's going to alter the quality of the stellium to some extent. So, for example, if Venus was next door in Scorpio, then all of those. Libra planets and the stellium would be ruled by Venus and Scorpio, which is going to change things substantially in terms of the interpretation. Right? right. She might have been a she might have been like a rock musician if that had happened or something. Like she would have been sort of more punk. Whereas you know Venus is like in Libra, so it's it's sort of more uh, it's just pop, you know, and, and sort of more uh, uh, I don't know, I guess sort of classic um, kind of. Uh, Sound or something like that with Venus in its own sign, or yeah. Classically popular styles, pop music, right? Um, so, so that's one factor. Other factor is just this is an example because we like this is a speculative time. It's like ten a.m. So this would give her leap rising with that stellium in the first house, but we can't rely on it. So the other thing I wanted to emphasize about this one is just. The other thing stelliums do is they just place a huge emphasis not just on the house but on the sign, and so there's something about the archetype of that zodiacal sign that's going to be more prominent in the person's life in general. And this is one of the reasons why I think some people resonate more with, for example, like their sun sign or um, things like that, because some people, your sun sign, there's like a not infrequent occurrence of the sun being one of the components of the stellium. So I think like you and I have that, for example, where one of the planets in my Scorpio stellium is my sun. And so I always identified to some extent with my Scorpio sun. And when I'd read delineations in the newspaper of what Scorpios are supposed to be like, for the most part, that was relatively accurate, albeit not always flattering. Um, but versus so so there's different people where if you have something like that, like a stellium with the sun sign, then that might lead you to identify more with that or to those traits to stand out more with your life and therefore um yeah to resonate more with if it was your sun sign although the reverse is also true so there's some people who um they might have a sun sign that's different than their stellium and in some of those instances the stellium actually is going to make much more sense for that person as a dominant theme in their life than the sun necessarily was so that doesn't mean that the sun won't, you know, represent them at all or isn't relevant in any way. But sometimes the stellium can really draw um, a lot of attention in the chart, especially when it is composed of personal planets. Totally. Yeah. All right. So let's go through some other examples. Uh, I know, you know, one of them that you liked was was Katy Perry, who's my like time twin, right? <laughs> yeah, it's been my long-running joke is uh, that uh, yeah, Katy Perry is uh, Chris Brennan's time twin. They were born somewhat close to each other, and obviously, you know, a striking resemblance. I know. But, um, I, I could have like gone that career route as well. Like, I had two choices. It was either, right. <laughs> it was either astrologer or pop star, and 
for whatever reason I chose astrology. Yeah. So yeah. I think what's kind of interesting about Katy Perry's chart is obviously, yeah, she has this massive Sun, Pluto, Mercury, Saturn, Moon uh, conjunction in the, in the first, a stellium in the first place. I think what's interesting about this example is that you can really see how each of the planets are incorporating or importing the topics of the houses that they rule. So on a very basic level, um, she has the moon in Scorpio in the first house. So Cancer is ruled by the moon, Cancer in the ninth. So the moon is importing and making more focal and making more personal the topic of the ninth house of um of religious matters, you know, is one of the ninth house topics. And so she uh she was raised by very strict uh, religious parents and her residence changed a lot because her parents set up new churches and she was put in religious schools and religious camps. And even when she first debuted as a musician, she was originally like a gospel or religious artist before transitioning to pop. So um, we can see how <laughs> having the moon in Scorpio rising is always going to import some of those ninth house themes of religion to the forefront of their life. And in her particular case, she has the moon closely conjunct Saturn, and Saturn rules the fourth house. So that's how we know it sort of connects her life, not just to the topic of religion. She, it's, it was more through the uh, strict uh, rules placed upon her by her parents. They didn't even allow her to eat cereal. Um, they didn't like her eating uh, Lucky Charms because they it reminded them too much of Lucifer. <laughs> they thought it was a satanic cereal, you know. So I think you know uh, she could probably relate to someone who you know has said they they've had strict parents. She has Moon Saturn in the first house in Scorpio. Scorpio is also not a fantastic sign for the Moon either. Um, so uh, I think it's interesting how the you can see how the Moon's rulership of the ninth. May, it, it, makes its presence in the first house sort of more angular or focal in in her life and same thing with with saturn um and then you could also go into the fact that sun rules the 10th house obviously she is a very uh, prominent person in the entertainment world her sun is even empowered by that close conjunction to, to uh, pluto and scorpio so um she uh, has this uh obviously very uh, kind of a uh, bubbly public persona uh this sort of pop star charisma uh with the sun and moon in the first place um and there was one other thing i was going to say about her but i can't remember what it was oh one of the kind of interesting thing is um you know you can apply stelliums to the perfections and i know we don't have a whole lot of examples of that but just a quick one for Katy perry when she was 24 years old in a first house annual perfection when all of those planets in the first house were activated that was um that was that was the year that she did her first headlining world tour so she was traveling important you know put the topics of the of the ninth house and uh it was really a showcase the first sort of you know global showcase of her uh of her act um she had come to prominence during the 12th house perfection, but the first house year was really when she was actually uh, performing all around the world for the first time. So I thought it was kind of an interesting example. And one other thing about Katy Perry that is cool too is the minor period of the sun is 19 years. So in the 19th year, when you're age 18, that's when the sun comes to completion. And it was in, it was when she turned 18 that she uh, chose her new name uh, because her original name is, I think is something like Catherine Hudson, but she renamed herself Katy Perry. So she took on this new moniker as she reached legal adulthood and as the sun was reaching its uh, period of completion. Nice. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great example. And so, yeah, so that's an example of somebody, again, with a f heavy focus on a specific sign in her instance, Scorpio. Um, and let me see if we have any, I mean, one of the others, no, this isn't really a good one. This is only three planets, but also includes the Ascendant, but just like George Lucas, for example, has Mercury, Venus, Sun in the rising sign in the first whole sign house, and just his 
you know, even though he became known for like Star Wars and Indiana Jones, um, had more of an artistic approach to film and film as an art. And I always think about that when it comes to his chart and his even continuing issues with like creative control about like who controls his art and does he control it and can he go back and like change it as he sees and like update it periodically because he's never like happy with it, it's never finished or does it be, belong to the audience and to the public once it's been put out there? And should people, for example, be able to have like the original um, Star Wars cut from the theatrical release, which he's kind of refused to put out there? Um, anyway, there's lots of ones where it's just emphasizing that house, and especially when it's in the first house, the person having more <clears throat> more direct control or apprehension of that stellium. As opposed to it manifesting through some other part of their life, or or through somebody else, if it's in one of the other twelve houses. Yeah, absolutely. And you can even draw a few Taurus associations to uh, George Lucas as well. You know, he he loved working with, uh, at least in the originals, you know, these physical uh, puppets and and uh, physical effects and practical effects uh, to achieve right. his uh, vision. And so he was just, you know, he designed all these crazy looking aliens you know for these original uh you know movies and uh yeah it just had a really strong sort of sense of creating a whole world you know which we'd associate with you know yeah the archetype of the artist you know and there are, That's there a, are a bunch point. of other really good examples of Venus. and also the the creation of what like industrial light magic because once yeah. there was a lot of stuff they were doing with star wars that they there was no company set up to do those kind of um uh you know graphic or um Design things in terms of props, or or even eventually computer technology, and then especially once the with the prequel toilet trilogy that started coming out in the 1990s, really pushing forward with um, technological inv- advancements in order to design new worlds and new aesthetics and make them look real in the uh, the first three. Star yeah, Wars that was movies. that was when Neptune was square his Venus that he was doing all that stuff. Oh, right? Neptune you know, from Aquarius. Aquarius. Yeah, that's yeah. why he got in more into digital and synthetic representations of his creative ideas. That makes sense. Um, all right, let's uh, let's bang out some other house examples. I just want sure. to get through so we get them in. So I'm just going to go through an order, and this or it's just going to jump around. But here's like Richard Harness who had has. Gemini rising, and he has Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and the degree of the midheaven in Aquarius in the ninth whole sign house. And he famously is like a, <clears throat> you know, university trained and university professor who, um, you know, he wanted to write this like sweeping book on astrology that would cover all of the historical correlations with astrology and sort of like show that it's a legitimate phenomenon from a historical standpoint. Um, but in order to do that, he felt like he had to like write this little blow-off book that was supposed to be like a, an overview of Western thought, so you could establish the parameters of like what Western intellectual history was. And so he wrote that book as a precursor, and it was called *The Passion of the Western Mind*. But then it ended up being wildly successful and like assigned in many university courses as like core reading material. But little did many people know that then, ten or fifteen years later, he wrote this big. Magistral work on astrology, uh, which was Cosmos and Psyche. So he's one of my favorite ninth house quasi quasi stellium examples. Um, let me see my next one. Oh yeah, Christopher Reeve is a third house stellium example, the house of like short distance travel, and he had Leo rising with the Sun, Mercury, Saturn, Neptune, and Venus in the third whole sign house, um, and he was. Earlier in his life, like very sporty, and he liked to, um, you know, engage in many like ath- athletic stuff, um, like boat racing and horse racing and all sorts of other stuff. He famously played Superman in like the 1970s and the Superman movies. Uh, but then also because Saturn is there in a night chart, he was involved tragically in a accident with a horse when he was out like riding his horse one day and like jumping over something where he was thrown from the horse and then um it severed his spine and then he became a paraplegic um so his mobility which is the third house thing was severely limited and restricted 
But then as a result of that, he ended up becoming somebody who promoted um, research into like stem cell ther- therapy and things like that in order to help um, people in similar conditions like his. And also so that's just that and importing its uh, topics of the sixth. Okay. Of injury, sixth, of sixth own injury, the illness. Yeah. Yeah. And then also his wife, wife involvement and her help, which was super important and instrumental in terms of, you know, keeping going, but also then founding their, the foundation that they put together. So that's a interesting example again with the most positive, but also the most negative planets in the same house, as well as the ruler of the ascendant in that house, just drawing like a huge amount of attention and focus eventually. Um, let's see other examples. Oh yeah, Meghan Markle has a fourth house Libra stellium. So she was born with Cancer rising, and she has the Moon and Saturn and Jupiter and the IC and Pluto in the fourth house. This is a night chart, so it's a little tricky that Saturn, again, is kind of problematic there. And I know there were some problems with her father, and I think when she finally got married, when she married uh, Prince Harry, um, her father like wasn't invited or was like kept out of the wedding or something, right? Uh yeah, honestly, I haven't been keeping up with all of that drama, but um, you know, it's funny though because it occurs to me like I've seen uh, cases where people have like difficult planets in their fourth house, and it's not just difficult situations with their own parents, but also the parents of their spouse, like problems with parents, as in one's parents. Family. And I don't think, yeah, I don't think anyone has had a worse <laughs> experience with their in-laws. Uh, than uh, than Meghan Markle. I mean, um, you know, poor thing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> things, have, things have not not been going well since she married into the British royal family, <laughs> mar- marrying right. Prince Harry, who is um, one of Princess Diana's sons. And there's been all sorts of like weirdness and controversy there. I think it's interesting because it's like Saturn's in its exaltation. Yeah, and this chart has really made me think of what exaltation is, and sometimes literally representing things that are like. Raised up or elevated in some way, like you know, a royal, the royal family that she literally. So, is. so the fact the f- that the ruler of her seventh then is that Saturn in Libra in its exaltation in close proximity with Jupiter. That show, yeah, like right, marrying to then, the royal family, but also <laughs> yeah, but then the it's tough. It's and it, didn't, it didn't go super well, and the royal family wasn't super receptive to her, or somehow we don't have to get into all the details because we don't even know all the details, but we do know that they. Harry and and Meghan Markle in the past few years, actually, I think in the past years when Saturn was like transiting through her seventh house through Capricorn, they finally uh, got out. They they bailed and like left the UK and moved to where, where are they living? Like Canada or something? I at think this so. Point. Yeah, they they escaped and. I'd say good, good for them. <laughs> and Harry, they did like an Oprah interview at some point, and Harry said something about just seeing what was happening to his wife and feeling like he was going to lose her if he didn't take her out of this situation. So that's what they did. So I just think that's really interesting in terms of very simple symbolism of like fourth house as family and sometimes parents, um, but then having some challenges there. Um, but also a lot of activity there, having a stellium there. And somehow, again, if you were just like, at some point, the concept of family is going to be incredibly important to you, there will be some major challenges, but it will also draw um, a major part of your life focus and attention since the ruler of the ascendant is the moon and is also placed there. And yeah, that became you know strikingly true or abnormally true, we might say in her case. That's kind of almost a good stellium keyword. like. Abnormally true that that will draw, especially so. <laughs> yeah, especially right. so. Right. Um, all right. So that's Megan Markle. That's a good one. Let me see. Yeah. Um, a kind of tricky one is like Mac Miller. Both you and I found came across this one. Um, so he was born with Aquarius rising and a stellium in Capricorn in the twelfth house. So it's like Mars, North Node, Mercury. Uranus Neptune and the Sun, um, so that Uranus Neptune conjunction, which is more generational, is like drawing a lot more attention. But there would already be Mars, you know, North Node, Mercury, and the Sun there, even without that. Right. So, what was his story? Well, um, 
I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound reductive, you know, of his story, you know, down to his sort of, you know, his worst moments, you know, obviously he was a, a very beloved and uh, successful uh, rapper. And, um, but, uh, he, he, the 12th house has to do with, uh, uh sometimes sp spiritual suffering. Uh, we might even interpret that in modern terms as, uh, uh, mental health, uh, issues, challenges. And, um, so he spoke a lot about his, uh, issues with depression and, uh, his struggles with substance abuse and, um, he, well, there's another kind of funny story with the 12th and as far as enemies, but, uh, you know, unfortunately he is someone who, um, you know, who eventually sort of succumbed to his, the, uh, mental pressures of, of fame and, um, his own feelings about himself. And, uh, he, he passed away due to suicide and, um, was it, was, well, I thought it was just a accidental drug out for this. Oh, it was. Oh. Pardon me. I I guess I didn't read as deeply as that. I just been working off what I saw in the headlines. But um, but one of one other sort of interesting twelfth house story with Mac Miller that I think is interesting is that the twelfth house also has to do with rivals or enemies or mm. nemeses. And right. so one kind of interesting thing about Mac Miller is that he had made a song back in like 2010 or 2011 called Donald Trump. And it mm. was about, um, it was kind of like glorifying the sort of life of, of uh, luxury or excess of a successful businessman. But, mm. um, and, and at first, Trump was okay with this song, but, uh, um, eventually he, uh, they got into some sort of legal standoff about his, you know, ability to use a song or being able to profit from it. And so eventually he kind of became like, um, they kind of became like, enemies and there's this big public feud a dispute between uh donald trump and this like 20 something <laughs> rapper um and uh so and then and then of course mac miller made very uh, sort of public and funny uh rebukes <laughs> of uh donald trump. this is all before he even became president or anything but um so just the fact that he was involved in such a kind of public and and bitter dispute over a song that he had become kind of associated with is interesting when you consider that the ruler of the 12th was in the first and that the focus of this stellium was happening in the 12th house. So it had to do with, you know, not just his own, uh, enemies, his own sort of personal demons, as it were, but also externally, you know, uh, nemesis, uh, like, uh, Donald Trump. Right. Um, and the other thing relevant about his 12th house stellium and just the, the end, uh, was that he Mac Miller died in September of 2018, and this was during that first year of Saturn. Saturn went into Capricorn back in what December of 2017. So he was like a year into Saturn transiting, not just through his twelfth house, but over that twelfth house stellium, um, which can be kind of a tough, tough transit when. Uh, you know, any malefic is like going over your stellium. It's sort of hitting everything in your chart at the same time. So if that's a good transit, sometimes all the good stuff happens at the same time. But when it's a heavy transit, sometimes all the really heavy stuff kind of uh, clusters up on you at the same time as well. A confrontation with his twelfth house, you know, enemies in a sense, his own personal demons. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Um, all right, so let's go on to some other examples really quick of just like stelliums so I can get through the rest of mine. Um, let's see, so T.S. Eliot is a time chart who had a Libra stellium with Mercury and Venus very closely conjunct the ascendant at 25 Libra, but also the Sun and Uranus in that Libra stellium in first whole sign house as well. And he was, of course, a famous award winning poet. Um, James Earl Jones had a Capricorn or has a Capricorn stellium with Mercury, the Ascendant, the Moon, Saturn, the Lot of Fortune, and the Sun all in Capricorn, um, which is really interesting and cool. Um, that Mercury Saturn conjunction, of course, I've talked about in different episodes. I think we talked about it in the Mercury episode I did with Joe Gleason last month, and he had and, um, and in the Saturn and Capricorn episode as well, I believe. 
Okay. Yeah. And he had a, a speech impediment early in life, but he was later able to overcome it. And then, of course, ironically becomes famous for his voice, his deep, like booming voice later in life, including being the voice actor of like Darth Vader. Um, so, yeah. M- that's Mufasa. A- oh, yeah. Mufasa. Other, another- other, yeah. Other ones. Are you a Lion, Lion King fan or Aladdin fan? We had a debate about this. I'm more of an Aladdin, <laughs> Aladdin guy. Or what, what's your what's your Disney Renaissance oh, like gosh. movie preference? If you had to pick Yikes. one, during I don't know. The I was Disney. I was. You're I was too prob- young. I was probably a Lion King kid. Okay. I remember right. my mom told me she got the VHS of Lion King, and I remember just like I don't, I was never more happy than that moment. I think. Okay. So. Um, I don't- as an Aladdin guy, I don't know but, if like, we can be friends anymore. I'm sorry, <laughs> but but I do think that uh, Alan Menken's score, uh, the songs for Aladdin, especially the the, the Broadway version with like some of the other songs, I think that's uh, in some ways the superior one musically. But I mean, okay, um, this is this is Todd. You're you're asking me to choose between my left and right arm, Chris. Yeah, that's true. I mean, well, you and you're probably also more up to date with the recent ones, although they've been doing like the live action ones of everything now. I wish. Like the on paper, the live action Lion King sounded like it was going to be a lot better than it was, and I I wish that was like better if somehow. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah, I did see it. Um, okay. I mean, it wasn't yeah. bad. I mean, it wasn't bad in any way. I still liked it. It wasn't bad. I just I was thinking the whole time, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, I enjoyed the live action Aladdin though. Um, yeah, that it was, was better than I thought pretty... it was. It was better than I thought it would be. It was Will, Will it was Smith as the Smith genie good. was a casting. Uh, yeah, that was that was that genius. was that was a good choice. <laughs> All right, good. that's that's enough Disney <laughs> digression for this for this episode. Let me switch back um, to. Let me see. Oh yeah, Michael Bloomberg is another one. Both of us found he's an eighth house stellium with Cancer rising and Venus Mercury. The moon and Saturn in Aquarius in the eighth house. And the eighth house, of course, traditionally is like other people's money, but there's been interesting ways in which that sometimes works out in the charts of like financial people or people that deal in finance. Um, he actually, I think, made his millions or his billions initially through developing like a tracker, which um, helped to track. You know the stock market and help to tr- track the market and different things like that. Um, so yeah, billionaire with an eighth house stellium is pretty interesting and appropriate. Um, Paul McCartney is a tenth house Gemini stellium. So one of the Beatles, who then also went on to have a successful solo career, but I always liked how he was a, a Virgo rising ruled by Mercury up there in Gemini and. Um, with Virgo rising and the Uranus, Saturn, Mercury, the Midheaven, and the Sun all in the tenth whole sign house in Gemini, and he's of course one of the most famous sort of songwriters I think of the past century. Is that would that be an accurate statement? Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think he. You really see the. Um, I think you really see the sort of cleverness in his songwriting and his and his. In his in, lyrics and uh his sort of inventiveness and you know it's funny too because when you compare all the beatles charts together you can really see the how the differences between them really are expressed in the charts you know lennon was this really sort of mars type of guy with mars ruling his ascendant whereas paul mccartney is just mercury and gemini and one of the big differences between mccartney and lennon is that uh john lennon preferred to um sort of uh just do like one raw take. He didn't want to plan things out too much. He just wanted to hash it out as sort of fast as possible. Whereas Paul McCartney was always getting hung up on making sure that all of the, you know, is this the right chord? Is this the right way we should do this? He okay. had this more sort of mechanical or uh, technical sort of approach to songwriting. Whereas uh, John like Lennon had this more, it. yeah, he kind of, yeah, it's sort of much more particular and, and making sure that every little part is right. Whereas Lennon was more about raw passion and energy. Uh, you know, in his recording style. So I think uh, that's uh, a way I kind of understand Paul McCartney as a songwriter is that he's like a, a uh, an engineer of, of sounds and mm. what, well, you know, he's kind of uh, got this mercurial approach that's uh, done, done well for him. Nice. Okay. Um, all right. So moving on, Harrison Ford is Libra rising with a cancer stellium, uh, Mercury, Jupiter, the sun, and 
uh, the moon, all in Cancer in the tenth whole sign house, and he famously he kind of lucked out. He was like um, getting into acting, but he was actually like working as a carpenter. I think when he for George Lucas when he was like cast in one of George Lucas's movies, and then later went on to star in like Star Wars as Han Solo, and then eventually Indiana Jones, and so on and so forth. Uh, so George Lucas, Cancer Stellium. Um, oh yeah, so there's some tricky twelfth house examples. There's like Bruce Lee who had Sagittarius rising, and he had this kind of tricky twelfth house stellium of Venus, Mars, the Moon, the Lot of Fortune, and Mercury, and all of those were kind of tightly opposite to the ruler of his ascendant, which was Jupiter at seven degrees of Taurus conjunct Saturn at nine Taurus, and then you're, with a T squared of that Pluto. <laughs> yeah, that, that Pluto at four. So his whole thing was tricky, but as far as I understand, he well, it was just kind of tricky, and he ended up like dying of an accidental drug complication. They think um, of taking something at the wrong time and then passing away. Um, so other twelfth house example, interestingly, another Sagittarius rising is uh, Joe Biden, current U.S. president, three degrees ish of early Sag rising. Um, he has a Scorpio stellium with Mars, Mercury, the Sun, and Venus in Scorpio in the twelfth house. Of course, this is kind of a tricky one because Mars is there in a day chart, and he, um, of course, famously during his Saturn return, he has Saturn conjunct Uranus on the descendant in the seventh whole sign house of relationships, and famously during his Saturn return. Um, he had just gotten elected to public office for the first time, and then like a, a month later, his wife and children were involved in a horrific car accident, where his wife passed away and his daughter passed away, and his I think his son was seriously injured. Um, so his is tricky because he he has so much twelfth house and eighth house emphasis with even Sagittarius rising and Jupiter the rule of the ascendants in the eighth house and. Um, he's had to deal with uh, the concept, broadly speaking, let's say of like loss or mortality or you know suffering um, quite a bit in, in in his life with these different losses. Later, including his son, I think it was like his oldest son died just a few years ago, right? Yeah, well, I was going to say Mars rules his fifth house of children, so he's seen the deaths of a couple of his children, and and of course Mercury rules his seventh house. Right. Uh, so we, you know, that's when he saw the passing of his wife was at the, at the, um, sat at his Saturn return. I can't remember when he met his current wife, but, um, yeah, it, it, you can see how some of the houses that each of those planets rules we could see as being somehow placed in the, the 12th house, showing that there was topics, whether it's his children or his wife, would be in a, Sort of more perilous, sort of position or imperiled uh, kind of position in the twelfth house, in a place of weakness or potential for tragedy, and that at certain points this could be activated with the right perfection and transit. Yeah. So uh, when I was researching this episode, and I was looking for my stellium examples. I I don't know how I never saw this before, but I happened to come across one of the f pieces of data in my file. Turns out that Jimi Hendrix was born like a week after Joe Biden with the same rising sign, so that they end up having some of the same house placements. But it's interesting because a good chunk of Biden's Scorpio stellium by a week later has shifted into the first house, so that it's in Sagittarius with Sagittarius rising and Mercury and the Sun and Venus. Um, being in the first house in Jimi Hendrix's chart, which is really interesting because he was much more of a like, you know, free spirited Sagittarian character, but all of that, his that guitar on fire, <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> all yeah. of that is very closely because it's like Mercury's at two, the Sun is at four, Venus is at seven, Sagittarius. It's all closely opposing that Saturn Uranus conjunction. At um, Uranus is at two, Gemini and Saturn is at nine. Gemini. So, what's unfortunate about that is that that's actually, it seems like that's putting some of that intensity more towards the concept of self and to like the body and physical vitality of Hendrix instead of with Biden. It's like 
affecting other people in his life that are around him that he's experiencing the loss of. But then famously with Hendrix, he actually died during his Saturn return, during the early part of Saturn and Gemini. So he was part of like the 27 club of like all the famous musicians that have died at 27. Um, and that was when Saturn was in early Gemini. So it's really weird how you know, Jimi Hendrix died during the early part of his Saturn return, and then during the later part of Saturn and Gemini, when Biden had his Saturn return, was when he was both elected to public office for the first time, but also suffered that major loss of his his family members, of his wife and daughter. So I thought that was an interesting bit of trivia. If everyone asks you, like, what celebrity birth chart is the closest to Joe Biden, the answer is evidently Jimi Jimmy Hendrix. Hendrix. <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix. Um, let me see. I'm going to skip that example. We did Meghan Merkel. Edward Snowden is our Gemini rising first house stellium example with Mercury, the Ascendant, Mars, the North Node, and the Sun in Gemini in the first whole sign house. And he was a famous whistleblower who like announced or um, disclosed, you know, this government program of the U.S. like spying on. Communications around the world. Um, totally. For some reason, for some reason, I have two sixth house stellium examples that are both famous tennis players. So one of them is Serena Williams, who had Taurus rising and a Libra stellium with the Sun, Saturn, Jupiter, Pluto, and Mercury there. And the other was a more, I think, recent one, Dian- Danielle Collins, who had Cancer rising and. The North Node, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, and the Moon, all in Sagittarius, so Super Sagittarius Stellium. Not entirely sure what the connection is there, but I think that's interesting. Um, are there any others that you really want to touch on? I think you only had one other that you gave me to calculate, and that was Van Jones. And you thought that was a good Virgo example, right? Six yeah, times? Uh, basically. So Van Jones, you might have seen him if you watch CNN. Uh, he's an author and political commentator. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of his areas of expertise have to do with um, the green economy, uh, environmental capitalism, and um, economic justice, human rights. Uh, his first book, I think, was it was about uh, green jobs, and he was actually an advisor to President Obama on um, green jobs, and so. It's interesting just because we tend to associate Virgo, uh, some of the qualities of Virgo as being relevant to um, some of these ideas of like sustainability, practicality. Um, and then we, in his specific chart, it's in the sixth house of, of work and, and service. And he seems to be just constantly uh, coming up with a new thing or partnering with a new uh, uh, advocacy group or charity uh, to promote uh whether it's job skills for underprivileged youths or, um, you know, or a new uh, environmental justice uh, campaign or effort, uh, he seems to be right there. So we can kind of see some of the the, the sixth house themes of, of service and uh, uh, labor and uh, and the mercurial themes relating to Virgo having to do with. Uh, service and employment, and and uh, some of those Virgo themes that that kind of connect to this idea of him being this um, kind of expert on uh, sustainability and uh, green jobs and green economies, etc. Yeah, and environmentalism and just focus on things like like plants or the earth in general is an interesting, sometimes overlooked, like Virgo um, archetype that's sort of built in there. So, and for those listening to the audio version, he has uh, Aries rising, and he has the Moon, Jupiter, Pluto, the Sun, and Uranus all in Virgo in the sixth house. I was also going to say that I think the the book The Silent Spring was released during the Uranus Pluto conjunction in Virgo, and Van Jones has talked about before about how that book, The Silent Spring. Uh, influenced him and I was seen as kind of like the foundational text of the modern environmentalist movement. So I think it's kind of interesting that he was actually born in the approximate time frame when um, environmentalism was sort of really uh, becoming a discrete force in um, the world. Right. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, why don't we 
bring it full circle and talk about just what what we've learned today and what we what the main points are that we want to leave people with. I think the main thing I just want to leave people with is just a stellium is one of those things like an aspect pattern or like a chart pattern that will sometimes draw your attention uh, when you're first looking at a new birth chart. And that can be a really good thing because sometimes if you see, if you spot a stellium, you know that that's going to be a sign of the zodiac or it's going to be a house that's going to stand out in that person's life in some way, uh, for better or worse. So it can be a very useful interpretive tool from that standpoint, just in terms of reading charts, just like other aspect patterns, because it's one of those things where you can just like see it visually and recognize it and, and immediately have a, a jumping off point for starting to interpret the chart. And understanding something that's going to be important in some some global sense for that person's life. Is that is that your uh, yeah. is that how you feel yeah, as well? Yeah, I mean that's okay. that's good. I mean, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's an emphasis uh, in in someone's in someone's life, uh, quality of the sign and the particular house that it occupies. That's going to be a particular emphasis, and I would also say that. If you wanted to do like a full tally of how to analyze a given stellium, then you need to consider the nature of the planets and what they contribute to that sign, as well as um, the conditions of those planets according to sect and aspect and dignity, as well as the houses that the planets rule. I think that's probably one of the most useful. I mean, it's all useful, but I think it's one of the most illuminating things to me about analyzing a stellium is. Uh, acknowledging the planet's role as a ruler of another house, because that's how, because for some people they might go, well, I have this great emphasis in this one house. I do have other parts of my life. You know, what does my child have to say about that? And it's like, well, uh, you know, you should look at the, the, the rulers of those houses and see how they connect to the house they're all present in. And we've given a few examples of that already. Um, but you can really see how a stellium it doesn't just say something about itself in that house. It also says things about the houses that those planets rule as well. Yeah, and sometimes that can feel really complicated and can overcomplicate <laughs> things. But right. um, yeah, just at least as long as you have that that initial starting point of what house is this in, what area of life should this relate to in the person's life, and what people in the native's life. Are represented by that house, then you've at least got a starting point for delineation, and then you can get into the finer details and the other specifics from there. Um, all right, stelliums. I think we co we covered a lot of examples. I'm I'm pretty impressed. I, I feel pretty good about it. How do you feel? I have a. I mean, I have a, I have a couple, a handful of more like just mundane ones to just sort of throw out there that are kind of funny or interesting. Okay. If you um, want to hear. <laughs> Sure. Oh yeah, there are some like are you looking at this one? Uh this this one. Uh okay, yeah, go with that one. Well, yeah, so I think one th one thing that's really let's just, interesting let's, about Let's do them quick. Yeah, sure. So one thing I think is kind of interesting is that the United Nations was founded on October 24th, 1945, which just happens to be out of Venus, Jupiter, Neptune, Stellium and Libra. And of course, Libra is the sign of Venus, which has to do with uh, balance and, and peacekeeping. And the entire point of the United Nations is to act as a, uh, a way for the world to co cooperate as a force for global cooperation and peacekeeping efforts. So we have the two benefics aligned with this more generational planet of Neptune. Uh, you know, that, that's what it's there for. Now, that also happened to the Mars Saturn conjunction, but that's a conjunction of a stellium. Um, another one that I thought was kind of uh, eerie is the fact that the first demonstration of the weapon, the AK-47, uh, was on November 13th, 1947. It was first demonstrated for Soviet officials. This is the weapon that is most commonly used in a lot of mass shootings. It's this notorious weapon. And on that day that it was first debuted, that was at a Mars, Saturn, Pluto conjunction, stellium in Leo. Um, so we have both malefics and Mars, the planet that traditionally represents weapons, um, and then is further empowered by its conjunction to Pluto. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty uncanny uh, combination of planets for the debut of of this notorious weapon. Um, and then one of the ones that just really blows my mind is the fact that oh, there it is. Yeah, the Mars Saturn conjunction in proximity to Pluto. 
Um, obviously, there's a couple other stelliums happening there at the same time, but I think the one that blows my mind the most is probably the fact that, and you may know this already if, uh, if you've looked at it before, but the fact that the moon landing itself on uh, July 20th, 1969, if you look at the ex exact chart, so I have the link there to the exact chart of the moon landing, uh, the moon itself was exactly conjunct Jupiter and Uranus. Um, so there was a moon, Jupiter, Uranus stellium at the moon landing itself. <laughs> and so I think for anyone, for any conspiracy theorists out there, I think that we never landed. I, oh, I right. don't know. <laughs> I you, mean, you, you mean when the government <laughs> pretended and set up a set uh, that made it look like we landed on the you moon? You know, the moon itself was conjunct Jupiter and Uranus at the, uh, and of course, the Jupiter Uranus cycle itself is often connected to great voyages and, uh, you know, um, amazing steps forward in in technological in uh technological accomplishments and uh space travel generally so i think that's kind of an amazing uh confluence of you know the moon itself is involved in the transit um and then like there, there are a couple other weird stellium connections i know you necessarily want me to go into those but uh it's just kind of a it's an it's another way to get a kind of a shorthand way of understanding important historical events like oh you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, that was the Saturn-Neptune conjunction 1989, you know, or, you know, oh yeah, the moon landing, that was the moon Jupiter-Uranus conjunction Libra, or the fall of the Berlin Wall, that was the Saturn-Neptune uh, and other planets uh, in a stellium in Capricorn, or the coronavirus, you know, is a Saturn-Jupiter-Pluto-Mars uh, stellium in Capricorn. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a really amazing way to kind of look at time. Yeah, let me show that because I didn't show it earlier. And that, that's actually what's funny ultimately to wrap this up is that there's long been in the astrological tradition historically like a conceptualization of like great events taking place in the world when there is an alignment of planets in the sky and when all of the like wandering stars somehow cluster together and line up in a straight line. And there's this famous legend attributed to Barosis from like the second century or Third century BCE, the Babylonian astrologer Barosis, who supposedly said that like the there was a periodic like creation and dest destruction of the world, and that the world would be destroyed by a fire when all of the planets aligned in Cancer, and it would be destroyed by a flood when all of the planets aligned in Capricorn. Um, so some of that's kind of like mythological or legendary, but at least it puts the idea of great conjunctions of planets or clusterings of planets as signifying great worldwide or sometimes momentous events. And we've been focused on this, of course, in terms of what it means for the individual in terms of their birth charts, and sometimes um, it indicating a notable or momentous area of a person's life. But what's weird is, as you're saying, it also applies to worldwide events, and sometimes important stuff happens when the planets cluster together in a certain spot in the sky, like it did last year when all of the planets lined up in Capricorn, or at least a lot of planets did. So here's the chart for that. Just like here's mid February when Mars went into Capricorn and stuff started to hit the fan, and we've got like Mars South Node. The Moon, Jupiter, Pluto, and Saturn all going through Capricorn, and then eventually they just keep getting closer and closer as you go through March until they all met up pretty closely right around here. Here's like March seventeenth. That was that, that was basically it. It was like Moon at seventeen Capricorn, Mars at twenty one, Jupiter at twenty two, Pluto at twenty four, and Saturn at twenty nine. Um, so during the Great. You know, pandemic, and especially during the lockdowns that we all experienced by this point in like the third week of March. What was funny is in the year ahead forecast for 2020, if you go back, uh, Kelly had come up with like, when we were joking about like no hugs March, and we said there would be no hugs in the third week of March because we were trying to interpret like, what does a stellium in Capricorn feel like? And we we're trying to interpret that back in like November of 2019. And we're just like, that's very dry. Kelly was like, it's very dry. Um, it's not very open. There's no connection. There's a closing off and like a pulling back into oneself. And, and we we're joking about like no hugs happening as our attempt to grapple with and, and sort of describe that energy archetypally. And, and that ended up working out pretty, pretty well.
I, I mean, back in 2017, I was even looking at the Saturn-Pluto conjunction saying that it was, uh, it relates to this theme of imprisonment or, or the, you know, and really the word I was looking for was, I guess, quarantining <laughs> right. uh, to, to self-isolate, you know. Yeah, that was in the, the Saturn and Capricorn episode that we did in 2017. Yeah. Yeah, so, so stelliums also are relevant sometimes in terms of mundane and world events, not just in, in personal lives. So I think that's been a pretty good overview of the concept and the technique of stelliums and some of the different variations and different debates about stelliums and the different approaches, but also just looking at charts and, and giving a bunch of examples. I think we've been able to give a pretty good overview here today. Um, so thanks, thanks for joining me for this. This was fun. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's been great. I think you had some great, uh, really uplifting examples, Chris. As always, thank you. As usual, that is my job here on the Astrology Podcast is to brighten everyone's life with my um, lovely example charts. I mean, I put I've tried to balance it. I I slipped some like positive ones in there, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's yeah. Sure. Yeah. No. Okay. You're gonna go home. <laughs> You're gonna start start. <laughs> Crying immediately I after got, this you know recording. What, though, I'm not much better though. I I gotta get I gotta get yeah. better about finding some more positive. Uh, I have to say, like levels. the invention of the AK-47 during a, a Leo conjunction, that was not the most rosy example. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. But, but well, I have right. Mars and Leo. Yeah, on my ascendant right now. So you haven't shared your stellium. I've been sh- throwing my stellium all over the place. Is that something you want to well, put out there? Your stellium's in the tenth house, so that's why everyone's seen it, Chris. Mine's in okay. the fourth. That's why I keep it hidden. All right, um, my apologies. I didn't. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I don't oh wanna... no, no, I wouldn't. Uh, no, I, I mean, no. It's uh, yeah. Mine's in the fourth, so I, I have the Moon, Venus, Mercury retrograde, and Pluto, all within about eight degrees of each other. Um, mm. No, thirteen degrees of each other. Right. No, Twelve. Do you want degrees me to show it? Sure, I guess. You know, um, I don't have to. I don't I know. Know, like, pr- pressure. <laughs> sure, I'm like go ahead. You. No, you can show my chart. It's fine. I, I okay. I'll sling it out. Uh, I guess it's our final example. Then, for whatever reason, we're gonna do this. So, 4, yeah, 000. you can see my Moon uh, is conjunct my IC. I have uh, Pluto, Mercury, and Venus in my fourth house, and so of course the. The fourth house is supposed to relate to one's origins, one's home, one's parents. That's so funny. I always forget that you just like barely missed out on the luxury of being a Scorpio with your your son being at twenty nine degrees of Libra. So I, I always think of you as a Scorpio, but you're actually a, a Libra I know. old son. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a lot of different things you could say about that, uh, but uh, I think one of the one of the interesting things I've sort of seen for myself, uh, if I was looking at my chart you know, as just like a client's chart, I see that the ruler of the 10th is this Venus in the fourth house. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of interesting about that is that, um, you know, aside from being an astrologer, I'm also, I've also done a lot of music. And the only reason I really pursued music is because my father is a sort of semi-famous musician in the classical music world. And um, I, for a long time, in my teens and in my early twenties, I went to school for music and I um, was kind of going down the path of going down a, a similar path as, as he was to be uh, a musician in the sort of classical music world. And so in a sense, I, my uh, career direction was almost going in the direction of my father, the ruler of the 10th being in the fourth house, joining the family business as it were, uh, you know, through Venus, uh, through uh, music. And my Venus just happens to be on the degree of my father's ascendant. Um, nice. So <laughs> there's kind of this uh, sinistry confirmation of, uh, of that kind of uh, placement. Um, but I think um, the, the other thing though that really seems to make sense for my child though as well is that while I have, I have these sort of dual passions, I guess, so I, I have music as sort of one track, but the other track obviously is astrology. And it was through my mother um, and her collection of astrology books and her knowledge of astrology um, okay. that I was able to pursue um, astrology. And I kind of see that through uh, the fact that the ruler of the ninth is a rule of this third, which is a mutual reception with Venus again in, in the fourth house. So it sort of shows that, you know, benefits through one's, uh, through one's parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
yeah, they're really the, you know, our, our, our home was always full of books and, uh, you know, full of music books and full of astrology books. So it's just, uh, I seem to have really, um, that has been a, a major kind of point of emphasis in, in my life. Like the sort of fundamental foundational things to myself come from my, uh, come from my parents. And yeah, uh, I like that. So the, the ruler of the fourth and the ninth and the third and some of your first astrology books were like your mom's astrology books yeah well and actually i only have my birth time because my mom otherwise i wouldn't have my birth time my mom's into astrology and she sort of made sure that i had my uh, right time so nice. um yeah so that's that's kind of how it's uh, that's how, kind of how it's been i also think that the fourth house because it's supposed to be a house of more sort of hidden or obscure things such shows that um the, the i don't always put that stuff on display you know um i'm sort of uh, in some ways i guess i'm unexpectedly private um but uh anyway that's that <laughs> all right well thank you uh, thank you for sharing that with us my very well, my, f- my fourth house friend um all right our shots uh, are really like opposite of each other in that way yeah, that's really funny. Although it's funny with your dad's ascendant being on at 15 Scorpio conjunct your Venus. What I've learned from this episode is that Scorpios beget Scorpios, and that's part of what happens, I guess. Propag- yeah, prop- yeah. The propagation of our zodiacal species. Um, all right. Thanks for joining me for this. Thanks, everyone, for watching this episode of the Astrology Podcast. Thanks especially to all the patrons that supported this episode um, because part of we're like getting some equipment for Patrick so we can record everything in HD with uh, lovely audio and video so we could do a high quality episode. And so all of our patrons that support us basically make this possible to keep doing episodes like this and basically teaching free astrology classes. So if you enjoyed it, think about it and you listen to the podcast regularly, think about becoming a patron to support us and get access to some bonus content like early access to new episodes or other bonus materials that I don't need to itemize right here. Uh, Patrick and I are thinking about doing that rectification course, so if you'd like to see that or you'd be interested in signing up for that, then please let us know in the comments section below this video on YouTube or on the Astrology Podcast website um, for this page. Uh, Also, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like it. Patrick, you've got a YouTube channel that you're You've got a lot it's of actually really good videos <laughs> under construction. But I have a lot, but, yeah, but I have a lot of videos on there, yeah. Do you remember what your URL is? Did you set a custom URL? I think it's just Patrick Watson Astrologer, I think. It's been such a long time. Okay. What's your main website at this point? Yeah, you're right. It is. PatrickWatsonAstrology.com. Okay. And you're doing consultations? I do needle consultations. I do horary consultations i do electional consultations and i also do rectification consultations and tutoring excellent well if anybody needs any of that then they should check out your website which is patrick watson you said astrologer.com astrology astrology.com yeah, okay yes. patrick watson astrology.com and then your youtube channel looks like it's patrick it's youtube.com slash patrick watson astrologer and i'll put links to that in the description below this video or on the Astrology Podcast website for this episode. So that's it. So thanks everybody for watching this episode of the Astrology Podcast or listening, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Bye. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to all the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, Kristen Otero, and Sanjay Srihari. For more information about how to become a patron and get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes or private subscriber-only podcast episodes, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Special thanks also to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, available at mountainastrologer.com. The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, Astro Gold Astrology Software for the Mac operating system, which is available at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 for a 15% discount, the Portland School of Astrology, available at portlandastrology.org, 
Astro Gold Astrology app for iPhone and Android, which is also available at astrogold.io. And finally, the Solar Fire Astrology software program for Windows, which you can get from alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 for a 15% discount.